All right, hello everyone. Welcome to another live streaming episode of Let's Fly. Today we're going to be flying the SR22 from TorqueSim. This is a G3 SR22. Uh, it comes in both naturally aspirated and turbo normalized variants. And it's from TorqueSim. It's part of the Take Command series, which means that it's highly realistic, highly detailed. Uh, there's a lot of engine management. There's a lot of avionics and systems management that goes in. Now, I do fly an SR-22 in real life. I fly a G-2, not a G-3. The differences between the G-2 and the G-3, mostly they completely redesigned the wings, giving it you know better cruise performance. Uh, they redesigned the parachute, giving it a better, bigger envelope. You can deploy the parachute at any speed, and they very much improved the useful load. Um, so basically, everything you would care about is better. Uh, in the G3, which is making me kind of sad that I have a G2. But here in the sim, we've got a G3, which is great. Um, and the engine is the same as the G2. A lot of the systems are the same. So I'm going to be right off the bat pretty familiar with this aircraft. I will say, however, this is only my second flight in this aircraft. So I'm probably going to stumble with a few things. So just bear with me. Um, so uh, just to get started, the, uh, air, the sim comes with a couple of windows here. The aircraft window is where you can uh, basically change your tail number. Uh, you can set your loadout. You can see here we've got fuel to the tabs, which is 46 aside. Uh, and we've got two passengers in the front seat, which puts us uh, just near the edge of the envelope. Uh, you can refill your TKS and oxygen. They're using a progressive maintenance system uh, with this, or I should say like a, uh, a persistent maintenance system. So you can inspect different components, you can overhaul, you can perform your annual. Uh, and this is also where you refill the oil um, or change it when you need to. And you can also clean the airframe now and then. Uh, and then lastly here we've got uh, basically is where you can go to charge the batteries if you're having trouble starting the aircraft, which can definitely be a thing. You can also turn on and off settings and we can take off uh, all the um, the tie downs and stuff like that. So let's pull the chocks, get rid of the tie downs uh, and the pitot cover and the inlet cover. And now this airplane is prepped and ready to go. So um, exterior wise, uh, you can see that this is pretty run of the mill G3 SR22. We do have a lot of extra um, equipment installed. We've got oxygen, uh, we've got Fikey as you can see. You can see the um, porous panels on the wings here, which is great. And it is approved for flight into known icing. Um, and you can tell from the antennas here that we've got, uh, you know, satellite weather, stuff like that. Um, oh, and you can tell it's Fikey because we have the additional porous panel here on the rudder. Let's hop into the cockpit, take a look. All right, so here we are inside the cockpit. Um, and this little guy here, his name is Milkshake. He joins you for uh, all of your flights just sitting there on the instrument panel. You can see by default, we've got the keys on the riser um, and we have the AVI tab um, EFB here, which you can use. It, it comes with Navigraph uh, support. So we can just like put in our current airport, uh, which is Beloit Airport 44 Charlie. Um, once I remember how to type in, yes, 44 Charlie. And, oh, come on, we got this, 44. C done. Ah, it doesn't have it in the system. Okay. In any case, um, you can see we've got front and back seats and uh, they're all modeled. We've got Cirrus's distinctive side yoke. They don't call it a stick, they call it a side yoke because it's really just one half of a yoke. Uh, and we've got throttle with go around lever, mixture, and um, up here, you'll see we've got the caps handle uh, as well as the placard. You can remove the placard and remove the pin as you would do during the pre-flight. And now caps is ready to be pulled. Haven't tried pulling this yet. We're not going to be pulling it on this flight. Sorry to disappoint. And then over here on the uh, door sill, you've got uh, openable doors. Now, 99% of a Cirrus pilot's effort on the ground is spent just keeping the aircraft cool. And one thing you can't do here that you can do in real life is kind of just prop the door with your elbow so that they're not swung all the way open, but you do get some airflow through the cabin. So we'll just shut the doors from now. Unlike the TVM, they don't seem to model, uh, you know, heat inside the cabin, so you don't get that red vignetting. Um, I'm sure it's really hot inside the cabin here. 
So like I said, uh, we're parked at Beloit Airport, uh, 44 Charlie. The plan today is to fly to Oshkosh. So the Pilot Edge Sim Venture event is going on right now. We're logged into Pilot Edge and we're just going to be making a quick trip north at 7,500 feet uh, to Green Lake where we're going to join the Oshkosh arrivals and uh, we're going to land at Oshkosh and taxi to a parking spot. So this should be a load of fun. Let's uh, get started now. Um, for the startup procedure, I'm just pretty much going to be doing this by memory. First thing we want to turn on battery two. That's uh, the emergency battery. It's a 30 amp battery, I believe, and uh, it will power only the emergency systems. And you can check that it's working by verifying that the flap light is off. The flap light is off. That means the one-way diode is working, and the uh, and battery two is only powering the emergency bus. So the PFD is going to come on, and you can verify here that battery one is not discharging the essential bus has 25 volts of power going through it. So with that done, we can turn on battery one and we're gonna get a caution now and we can't quite turn off that caution yet. So you'll just have to bear with me while that beeps away. And you can see here that battery one is now discharging. We still have 25 volts on the essential bus. So the MFD is coming up now. Uh, this MFD includes Cirrus's new um, Know Your Limits uh, system so it shows you basically your limits for you know if you're a beginner intermediate or advanced skier basically um, and then you can check your night and icing conditions as well following that you get your fit for flight uh, checklist your have your considered checklist and you know these other things to help make sure that you're ready to go and one more enter and you get to the fuel adjustment page so we'll say tabs because we filled it to tabs and then we'll hit uh, and then we'll hit enter. And so now we can dismiss the warning and the caution. So um, you can see we here on the uh, MFD, we've got our engine instruments and we can now start the aircraft. So in real life, the Cirrus is quite easy to start. At least my Cirrus is quite easy to start. But uh, here, for whatever reason, I've noticed it to be a little finicky, so it may take a few times to start it. But basically, the procedure is mixture rich, throttle full, just a touch of prime in the high boost setting, and then we'll crack the throttle, we'll turn on the strobes, we'll move the keys over to the ignition, we'll put it in both, hold down the brakes, set the boost pump to low boost, and then hit the starter. And of course it doesn't start because like I said, it's super finicky for whatever reason. There it goes. Hey, look at that. All right, quick little oil pressure check here. Um, oil pressure looks good. We're now gonna brutally lean the mixture, bring it all the way back to the X, maybe even the T if we can get it and just verify that we're at a thousand RPM. Now I've been doing this by memory, but if uh, you are the type to like your checklist up on the pH on the uh, MFD, you've got it right here. So it starts with the pre-flight inspection, which of course nobody would ever do the pre-flight inspection using the MFD. So you can just kind of skip those, skip the walk around all the way to the before starting engine checks. And then lastly, the starting engine check, which we could have done this, um, but we'll check everything down to where we are now. So ignition start, power lever has been retarded, mixture is leaned, oil pressure has been checked, alternator switches to on, and then we go over here and we verify the battery is now charging and we've got 28 volts on the essential bus. And now the avionics master comes on, we verify all engine parameters are in the green, and then we, we didn't use external power and we already verified the ammeter so we can move on to the taxi checklist. So before we taxi, we'll do a quick weather check here. Um, the Pilot Edge NOTAM requires us to be uh, standard day, 29.92 inches, no wind, stuff like that. So we're not gonna bother getting an ATIS. We already know the weather. So let's just set the barometer to 29.92. And then we'll do the before taxi checklist. So before taxi checklist, flaps are up. The reason they have this is because you would have put the flaps down for uh, the pre-flight check. Radio and avionics is required. Um, I'm going to hop on over to ForeFlight, and we're going to be using ForeFlight uh, for 
this flight because we're going to get traffic, pilotage traffic. If it works, we're going to get pilotage traffic on four flight. So we'll be using that to try to sequence ourselves in at Green Lake. And um, we're going to quickly just go take a look at Beloit. And it basically doesn't have its own CTAP. It just uses Unicom 122.7. So we'll set that at COM1 122.7. I wish you could do this with the GCU, which is the keyboard unit down here. If you can, I don't know it. That's another big difference between this aircraft and my aircraft is I have Avidyne R9 avionics. This uses Cirrus Perspective avionics, um, which I have a lot of experience with Cirrus and a, a little bit of experience with Perspective in real life, but I'm more familiar with the Avidyne. And also this is X-Plane, so it's not a complete uh, G1000 Perspective implementation. There's a lot of features missing uh, and a lot of stuff that you're not going to be able to do in the sim that you can do in real life, but there's still quite a bit in there. All right, radios and avionics have been set. Cabin heat, defrost. Uh, we've got air conditioning in this service, and um, so that's something I'm not used to. So you can see here we've got the electric fan set to speed one, um, and we can set it to, you know, cool just the head. We can even turn on the AC and watch how much power that sucks from the engine. It makes a noticeable difference in power. And you can turn on the recirculator as well. Um, so we'll leave the AC off until after takeoff. And we'll go straight to the fuel selector now, and we switch the tanks. There's only there's two wing tanks in the SR-22, and there's no both positions, so we have to feed from either one. Every time we switch the tanks, we always check the pressure, the fuel flow, and make sure it hasn't dropped off. If it does, we go right back to the old tank and then figure out why. So next up is the taxi checklist. So the parking brake, we'll release it. Test our brakes, just accelerate forward a bit, verify that the brakes are working, and then the rest of this stuff we'll do in a turn. Now the Cirrus in the sim, as in real life, does not have casterable nose wheel, or uh, does not have nose wheel steering. Instead, it has a free castering nose wheel. So because of that, we have to steer by pretty much just tapping on the brakes. So you gotta be kind of ginger about how you steer. You don't want to oversteer, you're going to just wear down your brakes quicker. Lord knows we have to replace our brakes quite a bit in the uh, real aircraft. So yeah, just occasional taps on the brakes here and keep your speed up because if you come to a stop, you're not going to be able to turn. You need to have some forward motion to turn. Just do a quick check for traffic, verify we are indeed on 227 transmit on Unicom. Two five. So we do need to Entered runway zero seven. Two five. Traffic, uh, Skyhawk one Mike Alpha taking uh, back taxi runway zero six flight. Let's do a quick check down at four flight. Actually, I can turn that off for now. So we'll back taxi now. to the uh, departure end of runway six. Always stay on one side of the runway when you back taxi. Increases your visibility and helps other people know what you're doing. Oh, I neglected to show you some of the other windows um, that the, uh, the Torque Sim SR-22 gives you. You can see here the electrical system is shown in detail here, including both alternators, both batteries, and um, all 11 buses, including the uh, three main distribution buses and all the other many buses. And you can see how changes in power change the voltage and amperage available to each bus. And then lastly, you also get the engine window here, uh, which shows you the status of air and fuel as it moves through the different parts of the engine. So you can see the temperature and pressure of air at different points uh, throughout the engine, including the upper deck, uh, the manifolds, and the exhaust, and the outlets. So this could help you diagnose issues possibly with your turbo or if you're not getting uh, the power that you uh, expect. And as well, you can see your CHTs and EGTs here, though you get that um, uh, as you would in real life in the perspective. All right. So we checked our instruments in the turn. So we just simply go to the next checklist and that's the before takeoff checklist. So before we do that though, um, we're gonna get set up 
uh, for the flight. So I'm just going to hit the flight plan button. And we've got most of the flight plan already in here. We just pretty much have to change the departure. So it says Fond du Lac to Green Lake to Ripon to Fisk to Oshkosh. So I'm just going to replace uh, Fond du Lac with 44 Charlie. So we should just be able to hit 44 C and then enter. Now it's got some weird thing going on at the end here. So let's try that again. 44 C. There we go, boy. And then enter enter again and then now we can just delete font the lag here uh, with clear and then enter and then we can activate the leg to green link oh, I don't know why it keeps doing that weird zero thing um, let's oh, large knob yes and then we'll hit menu activate leg and now we've activated the leg to green lake now uh, we do want some descent planning, and we have to be at, uh, we're going to be doing the, um, at Green Lake at 2300 feet and 135 knots per the NOTAM. So I'm going to move over to the altitude section, and I'm going to put uh, 2300 in here. Uh, it added another zero there. There we go. Enter. So that should give us some descent planning. <laughs> I plan to cruise at uh, 7,500 feet, so I'm going to plug that into the altitude knob. Oops, I zoomed in instead. So let's try that again. Very easy to zoom. Very easy to zoom in, apparently. There we go. 73.45. And um, we're going to be also flying runway heading uh, initially after takeoff, so I'm just going to set this to 060. We have to avoid Janesville's uh, Class D airport uh, on Class B, Class D airspace on departure. So we'll fly runway heading for a bit before we turn off course. All right, let's clear the flight plan. Go back to the checklist. Um, where's my checklist? Huh. Am I on a different page or something? There it is. All right, before takeoff, doors are both latched. In real life, obviously, you want to check this seal here and make sure the door is completely closed. You're going to have to board your takeoff, as I've done many, many times. Caps handle, we've already removed the pin. Seat belts and harnesses are secure. Air conditioner, as desired, we'll leave it off for takeoff. Fuel quantity, confirm. Fuel selector to fullest tank. We've been running off this one, so we're going to set it to the left and verify fuel flow. Fuel pump still in low boost. We're gonna leave it on low boost for the whole flight, though for longer flights, you can turn it to off and, and cruise. The checklist says to do it 30 minutes after cruise. We're gonna be spending less than 30 minutes in cruise. So we're just gonna leave it on the whole flight. Next year, we're gonna leave it lean. Um, I like to do my run-ups lean because it makes it more obvious the change in EGT as you do the mag check, which we'll see in a bit here. So we're gonna leave the mixture lean, set the flaps to take off, which is 50%. Verify they come down on both sides. Light turns on. Transponder. Um, we should have had it on alt on the ground. That's the new policy. But we're going to be squawking 1200 and alt now. Autopilot, test and disconnect. Uh, for whatever reason, roll trim is kind of funky in this current version of the SR22. Like, it doesn't move the indicator here, which, as you can see, is pointing, showing us a very uh, strong right roll trim. And it doesn't seem to move the ailerons either. In real life, you wouldn't trust this indicator. You look at the aileron where it meets the wing and just make sure that they're level, which they are now. And I don't want to mess that up, so I'm not going to touch the roll trim because I wouldn't see its effects until after I took off and the aircraft rolled one way or another. So I'm just going to trust that the roll trim is OK. Pitch trim, uh, you just want to make sure it's in the takeoff band here. So you just kind of bump it forward or back until it's in the takeoff band. Um, and like I said, we're not going to test the autopilot this time, but you could on the ground for whatever reason, though it's, uh, it, it works, but you can't see it visually because of the roll trim bug. Navigation radios, we're not going to use them. Um, GPS is already set. Cabin heat defrost is set. In real life, we'd be worried about the aircraft heating up at this point. Brakes hold power lever to 1700 RPM. Okay, you can see that up here. There we go. Uh, now we're going to verify the alternator. It has us turning on a bunch of equipment. We're going to turn on the landing light, pitot heat, 
verify that uh, the essential bus still giving us 28 volts and the battery's not discharging. And then we're going to leave the landing light on, turn off the pitot heat, and we're done with all of these. So we'll do the mag check now. We'll go to the left. And we want to verify the EGTs come up. RPM goes down. Back to both. EGT should go back down. In real life, the, the change is a little bit more noticeable than this. You can barely see it. Um, and then the right mag, I mean, I mean, these guys move up like one pixel. It's not really all that obvious. Back to both. I think in real life, I would be concerned uh, watching these EGTs not change. But the RPM does change, so that's a good sign. Engine parameters, we want to check at 1700 RPM. Everything's in the green. Power lever back to 1000. Flight instruments, uh, we just want to verify altimeter and cross check with the uh, backup altimeter, attitude and attitude, airspeed and airspeed, heading and heading. Flight controls, check on the left, the right, and the back. Trim is set for takeoff and autopilot is disconnected. We'll turn on the flight director, we'll put it in uh, airspeed, flight level change mode, and we'll set 130 knot climb. Ooh, I'm way past 130 there. Uh, with altitude select armed, and we will set heading mode with nav disarmed. So that's it for the checklist. So we can put this away, and we can go back to just the map view. We'll zoom it out a bit, and uh, we're ready to go. So we'll do another quick check, verify no one's in the pattern. Flight traffic, uh, Cirrus 171 Mike Alpha taking runway 6 straight out flight. So I'm going to just do my quick pre takeoff items mixture, flaps, lights, trim, transponder, doors, windows, pump, and timers not necessary. Bring it up to full power. Check RPM, engine gauges speed alive there's 70 knots rotate there's a thousand feet flaps up and we're gonna pitch down capture 130 knots and bring the power back to 2500 RPM. All right, now that things are stable, let's engage the autopilot, which should engage the yaw damper as well. And we are climbing. So next thing we want to do when we have sufficient altitude is go lean a peak. Uh, with the Tornado Alley Turbo installed, you can climb either lean a peak or ridge a peak. It's your choice. Um, but you must cruise lean and peak. There are no published figures for ridge and peak. So let's actually first, let's start our turn to the left now that we're clear of Chainsville's airspace, almost clear of Chainsville's airspace. So let's just turn due north. Um, and let's uh, do lean and peak. So to do lean and peak, first of all, let's reduce power till we get a max manifold pressure of 29.6. And then we're gonna do one big pull over the course of three seconds and just bring that mixture knob back and target about 16 to 17 gallons per hour. So there's 16.7 gallons per hour. And now the two numbers we want to watch are TIT, turbine inlet temperature, that's down here, it's 1510 and climbing, and CHT, that's here at 310. CHTs must always be below 450, should always be below 380. Turbine turbine inlet temperature must be below 750, should be below 1600. So we're going to target 1600 uh, turbine inlet temperature and no higher. So we've already crossed through a, th uh, a thousand feet, so we would say flaps, caps, and maps to remind ourselves that caps is available. The maps page is shown and the flaps are up. And that's about it. Uh, the Cirrus is a uh, the SR-22 turbo normal is pretty powerful aircraft, 310 horsepower, six cylinder IO-550, cruises at like 176 knots even down low, but uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, fixed gear, not a whole lot of switchology, the climb and uh, descent items are pretty quick, 
there's not a whole lot you have to memorize and the checklists are short, so uh, it's definitely a great airplane to fly. We're just gonna skirt the Jane's Hill Class D here. Um, actually, we may even be above it by now. Let me quickly check by hopping down, taking a look at floor flight. And uh, it's 3,300 feet, so we're almost above it, and then we can turn off course. So, main thing we're gonna be monitoring during this climb is our CHTs and our tents. I'm gonna be keeping, I'm gonna be going back to that over and over, just making sure our CHTs, this is what you would expect. Uh, we're doing 16.7 gallons per hour lean and peak, and you would expect to see CHTs in the vicinity of like 350 to 380, and uh, tents just below 1600. So, that's pretty much lining up exactly with expectations. It's looking good. We're above the Class D, so, um, gonna just hit the direct to button again. I'm gonna go direct to Green Lake and I'm gonna hit the nav button and we're gonna start our off course turn. So as you can see we've got oxygen here that you can turn on. Uh, I don't know if you have to put on a mask or anything like that. Uh, maybe that's automatic. We'll see. Um, and apparently the music's on. I feel like all of these are on. You can't turn them off either so okay. We can turn on the air conditioning now too if we want to um, kill some engine power, decrease our uh, decrease our available engine power. But since that heat isn't really modeled, I don't really see a reason to. One thing you can't do is open these air vents, so they're just stuck closed for the whole flight. because we've got a yaw damper taking care of everything for me now. Um, and I'm just going to adjust my camera view a little bit. I'm pretty tall in real life, so this isn't really a realistic uh, position for me. I can just kind of see outside uh, over the nose. So more like this is where I'd be in real life. Let's keep the heading bug synced. temperatures. As you can see, CHTs are above 380. We don't want that. Since we're lean of peak, we want cooler CHTs. We've got to reduce fuel flow, take it away from peak. So let's do maybe 15.5. You'll see uh, tits come down right away, and the CHTs should start to trend downward, hopefully getting below 380 pretty soon. power in the Cirrus. Remember, the Cirrus has a single power lever, which uh, together controls manifold pressure and um, controls manifold pressure and uh, fuel flow. So you are not going to, um, you're not going to be able to control your fuel flow independently of your manifold pressure. And in fact, um, it's not a FADEC or anything fancy. It's really just a linkage. There's a, a mechanical linkage between the propeller and throttle. So as you move the lever, uh, it moves the, th uh, the propeller lever with the throttle uh, in a preset way. It says pitot heat required. It's not actually required. It's only saying that because I uh, OAT is below five degrees, but you can see there's no visible moisture, so we're fine. Um, let's see how we do in uh, Green Lake. We got 63 miles to go till Green Lake still climbing. So uh, like I was saying, um, climb power in the SR-22, generally you want to target 2,500. Uh, and as you can see here, that's giving us 28.6 inches. This is a turbo normalized engine. Dodge County traffic, 365, we're on the attack speed to two zero. Got a legacy coming up at 2,300 feet. Let's go ahead and for you, Roger. Yeah, that's Fisk approach. That's going to be a very busy channel. We'll tune that in a bit. Um, anyway, like I was saying, uh, climb power, you want to target 2,500 RPM. You can see right now we're getting 28.6 inches of manifold pressure. Turbos are kind of finicky. Some days you'll get the full rated 29.6 uh, all the way up to the maximum altitude of 25,000 feet. Some days you're just going to be able to get 28, and uh, sometimes I can't even explain it. 
So uh, here we're getting 28.6 and 2,500. It's okay to increase power to uh, get max manifold pressure, but uh, you probably shouldn't exceed 2,500 RPM on the climb just for engine cooling. You can see here we're back down to 358 on the CHT, so we can add a bit more gas. Um, and uh, you should definitely not exceed 29.6 inches of manifold pressure uh, for any extended period of time. Sometimes that means you have to climb at 2,400 RPM or whatever just because uh, you, you can't get, uh, just because at 2,500 uh, RPM you're, it's doing something like 30 inches of manifold pressure, which uh, we can't do. All right, that's 1,000 to go. The other thing about um, these turbos is again the uh, the SR22 with the uh, IO550 and Tornado Alley turbo normalizing system should be able to main the full, maintain the full 29.6 inches of manifold pressure all the way up to a maximum altitude of 25,000 feet. Um, but the thing about these turbos is there's no way to know the intracylinder the intracylinder pressure the pressure inside the cylinder. All we have to go on is the CHT and the EGT, which tells us the temperature inside the cylinder and the temperature of the exhaust. Uh, but on cooler days, you may be able to get higher CHTs than you would normally, or sorry, lower CHTs than you would normally, but that is not a reason to continue to increase power. You shouldn't target power with CHT. And the reason for that is, even if it's a really cold day out and you're able to pump up the CHT higher with more power, you're also pumping up the ICP, the cylinder pressure, which uh, is going to cause long-term damage to your cylinders. So don't target CHT when you make power settings. Uh, set your power using fuel flow and monitor uh, EG, monitor TIT and uh, CHT. Those are your main monitoring instruments and your fuel flow is your main setting instruments. And um, if it's a cooler day, even if you can get more fuel flow, you should set the fuel flows that your engine's familiar with. So. I'm used to for crews being able to set about 16 gallons per hour. If it's a really cool day and I can keep the CHTs cool at like uh, 17 or 18, I'm still going to set 16 gallons per hour because um, I don't want to increase those ICPs, that intracylinder pressure. We're at cruise now. Uh, the SR22 comes with a lengthy cruise checklist, but really none of it matters. Uh, there's really no configuration changes you have to make. Uh, cruise power can be really anything. Um, Generally, you set power using uh, either manifold pressure as a limit, uh, or you want to target about 2,500 RPM at max manifold pressure. So we can continue to increase manifold pressure here to 29.6, and that just gives us about barely 2,500 RPM. And now, in order to set power level, we use fuel flow, because we're lean and peak and uh, it's turbo normalized. So as you can see, as I decrease fuel flow, percent power goes down. As I increase fuel flow, percent power goes up. And again, remember the only limitations are make sure your CHT is below 380 and your tits are below 1600. So about 75% power at 16 and a half gallons per hour. That is pretty much exactly what I would expect. I think in my service it would read 80% for this uh, for this um, configuration and not 75. But as you can see, we're also truing out uh, at a very similar airspeed. I would expect to true out around 175, 176, and we're truing out at 173. So pretty close. Next thing to worry about uh, is top of descent. So that should show up on the map, I think. Let's zoom out a lot. Yeah, there it is. That little dot right there, that's top of descent. If we go to the flight and land page, you can see here our active VNAV waypoint, 2300 at Green Lake, um, and our target vertical speed, 770 feet per minute, which gives us 10 minutes to top and descent. I like to descend at 800 feet per minute, so uh, that's pretty close to 770. And you can see this is kind of changing. Not sure. I think it's basically targeting the flight path angle of minus 2.5 degrees, which that's fine for me, so we'll leave it. Um, that's not quite how descent planning works in my Ammonite service, it works a little bit differently, but uh, this is good enough for me. All right, I'm going to pause the track AR, we're going to spend some time looking at the exterior of this aircraft, and then we're going to get ready for our descent to Green Lake. So let's go now to the, oops, still spot isn't what we want, we want Lynn.
linear spot. And we can't rotate. You know, yeah, we can't rotate. Maybe we want circle. That's what we want. Circle. Fly live. I'm going to turn my four flight audio down all the way. I forgot to turn that up. All right. So here we are in cruise over Wisconsin on our way to Green Lake. About 10 minutes till top of descent. You can see here, we've got customizable tail number. Kind of tilted at a weird angle. Um, the look of that kind of makes it look a little childish to me, like it's, you know, like a child did it. But, uh, I guess they were trying to match the curve of this line here, but it just looks weird. Honestly, I think it should just be straight. You can also take a look at some of the parts of the Cirrus here. So you can see we've got the elevator horns. Uh, we've got the step here. We've got our three uh, flat track hinges, pitot tube lights. They are not LEDs. No. Actually, they may be LEDs. I think they're LEDs. And then, like I mentioned before, uh, since this is the G3, we've also got our forward-facing lights here on the wings. Um, and you see our little tie-down nub there. And we've got stall strips here and here. These stall strips help make sure the inside of the the, in, the inner portion of the wing stalls first, so that you maintain aileron control even at the point of stall. Um, and then uh, we've got VGs here, these vortex generators, which help energize the boundary layer as the air travels over the inside portion of the wings. We've got um, the fuel uh, the fuel filler is here where you would put in your 100 low lead. And then the TKS filler is here on the uh, root of the wing. As you can see, it very clearly says no fuel because you definitely do not want to put fuel in your TKS uh, reservoir. I think it stores since it's Fikey, I think it stores what double, so what 16 quarts of TKS? I don't remember, but it's double what the non Fikey, uh, just the Weeping Wing aircraft have. So it's uh, one hour of TKS fluid in the max, two hours in the max pump setting, and two hours in the normal pump setting. Um, and then we've got our door handles here, notoriously very difficult to operate. And whatever you do, don't lock your airplane, or you're probably never going to unlock it again. Coming around to the front here, we have our landing light. Um, in our engine intake, We've got our uh, pair of exhausts and pair of um, cabin air intakes here. G3 puts them here on the side of the G2 of my aircraft that's at the root of the wing. And the wings are also famously cuffed in the Cirrus. You can see the cuff here, so there's a break in the leading edge, which again is to improve the stall characteristics of the airplane. And then up here we've got a handhold uh, for passengers and pilots to swing themselves up uh, onto the root of the wing. And we've got two static ports on the airplane, one on each side. You can see them here. Oh, and yes, it, since it's a Viking, I guess, yeah, there's two pumps. So you get two TKS filler ports on my aircraft. There's only one on the left side, so I wasn't expecting one to be on the right side. But I guess that's how it's Viking. Go back to the inside. We can take a longer look at the cockpit. So the circuit breakers are down here, and they do all work in the Torx MSR-22. So you can use any of these, pull them. I'm not going to pull any of them right now, but you can. And the uh, that part of the, uh, um, the avionics will stop functioning. And they're notoriously difficult. Actually, in the G3, they look easier to read because they orient them differently, and they're tilted out a bit. I don't know if that's the G3 or if that's a function of how this model is uh, displayed in X-Plane. But in my aircraft, you would have to pretty much duck your head into your lap in order to read any of these, which is going to be near impossible to do when you're bouncing around in flight in the middle of an emergency. And then uh, we do have the perspective, the GDU, which is the dis this display unit, uh, this data input unit here, which has got an uh, ABCD keyboard, numeric pad, and also some panel mounted controls for the autopilot and your comm controls here as well. AC controls here, as I mentioned previously. And then up top, we just have the dome lights. The dome lights are operated uh, using the lighting um, rheostats here. 
and passenger dome lights, which are operated by push buttons. Uh, either they're not working or uh, maybe they're just, uh, you can't really see it during the daytime. And then of course, the infamous cap seal. On the booster, we've got our switches. Again, two batteries, two alternators. Um, we got strobe and landing lights, as well as nav lights. Because this is FIKE certified, it needs an ice light. So we do have an ice light uh, that would just um, project a beam along the leading edge here so you can look for ice. Pedo heat and then our ice protection system takes up the rest of the switches. Um, you can switch it between norm, high, and you also have a push button for max um, where you can temporarily just put out a ton of TKS to break up any ice on the uh, leading edges. And then a push button for windshield ice where we would use a spray bar here to spray ice uh, TKS on the windshield. Um, don't do that when you're about to land because it really obscures your visibility. And um, it's, uh, there's no switch for it, but when you do turn on TKS, uh, there's a sling ring on the prop, which, uh, lets, which slings TKS centrifugally onto the propeller blades, and that removes ice uh, from the propeller blades. But some of that will also spray back onto your windshield as well. All right, let's see how we're doing on that top of descent. Looks like it's getting close. Still top of descent. I think that might be Green Lake in the distance there. Maybe. Probably. Anyway, we got to start getting ready for the uh, for the arrival. So first, I'm going to quickly check, see if I'm getting any traffic on the fourth flight. Um, not yet. We may have to be closer to get traffic, but I do have the Pilot Edge map up, and um, it is showing just a crap ton of traffic around Green Lake and on the arrival, just so much traffic. Um, so the plan is, per the NOTAM, which I have up, you can't see it, but I've got it up. The plan is, uh, we arrive at Green Lake. We have two choices, 1,800 feet at 90 knots or 2,300 feet at 135 knots. We're gonna take the latter choice. We circle Green Lake until we're established in a half mile trail um, behind another aircraft, no side-by-sides, no overtaking, no then from there we proceed to Ripon. We follow the railroad tracks from Ripon to the tiny town of Fisk. Uh, after Ripon, we'll be on 120.7, and we can expect to hear the um, pilot edge, or sorry, the, uh, the Oshkosh controllers tell us to rock our wings, and then they're going to give us landing instructions either for 27 or 36. If we land 27, we're just going to continue following the railroad tracks uh, into a right base or right downwind for runway 27. If we get assigned 36, we're going to make a right turn and follow Fisk Avenue for a left base for runway 36. After we land, we're just going to taxi immediately off the runway. Oh, and I should say, we also switch to a frequency for that controller, 18.5 for runway 27 or 26.6 for runway 36. They'll assign us to a dot to land on, like for instance, land on the green dot. We'll do our best to land exactly on that dot because everyone will be watching. And then we simply taxi off the runway as soon as possible and we taxi in if it's 27 basically counterclockwise flow around the runway uh, and I'll just park it somewhere in the north 40 because that's typically where I would have a camping spot. If it's runway 36 we'll have to taxi southbound on the parallel taxiway um, and that's typically only where you know like warbirds or home builds park and this aircraft is neither but we'll just cheat and pretend we're a warbird or a home built park somewhere alongside 36. We're getting a manifold pressure warning now because we're at 29.6 that really shouldn't pop a warning because the limitation is 29.6 or below. So 29.6 is a valid manifold pressure. So I would argue that that warning shouldn't be there, but in the uh, spirit of shutting it up, uh, I'm just going to decrease it to 29.5. As always, with a high-performance aircraft, we should be regularly checking tits, regularly checking CHTs, just making sure everything is nice and cool, which it is. And we just blew right past top of descent without turning on VNAV. So let's turn on vertical speed and set it down to about 800 feet. I will set it down to 1,000 feet per minute. And then uh, we'll turn on VNAV, and that should alarm VNAV, ideally. That's not happening. OK, well, we'll just fly it with vertical speed. 
Oh, maybe it's because the altitude bug needs to be set down. That's another thing different with garments, is you have to set the altitude bug down. So, no, vertical speed, my friend. Let's set it to 2,300 feet as our target altitude. Vertical speed, down, 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 and then now we can arm feet down. Perfect. So we got vertical speed, 1,300 feet per minute, altitude select, arm feet, path armed. That's what we want. And I'm going to turn on, I'm going to switch to Fisk approach now, so get ready for a lot of radio talking. Yep, uh, for the register, we'll get you here in just a second, just a little bit outside of Fisk, but thanks for the request. Everybody coming up the uh, railroad tracks, we'll pick you up by type and color. As you come up, 1,800 feet, 90 knots, or 2,300 feet, and 135 knots if you can't do the low altitude. Make sure you follow somebody half mile in trail, no over-unders, no side-by-sides. We'll pick you out as you come up the tracks, red series, half mile southwest of Fisk, rock your wings. We're also going to be a red Cirrus and beautiful rock. Right, continue Since that right Cirrus, turn, turn right, follow uh, east west road. For runway three six, tower will find left or right. Monitor tower now one two six point six. We'll expect the show. a whole lot of Cirruses. Thank you. It's going to be like a Copa flying more than Oshkosh. All right, V path is now active with altitude select armed, so we should be at twenty nine three hundred feet right as we reach Green Lake. At some point, I'm going to disconnect the autopilot. We're going to start hand flying the rest of this. getting into the yellow uh, above VNO on the descent, but we're in smooth air, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, the, uh, the descent check for the SR-22 pretty much just says to keep your CHTs above 240 on the descent. Beautiful Rock, Runway 7, they descend like to, to 27, follow Runway 27, uh, railroad track up to the railroad, up to the so uh, gravel the pit, and down Enjoy inside the, the gravel pit, Mark turned out 118.5, got a red and white Cherokee. Rock your wings half mile southwest of Fisk. Rock your wings for me, the red and white check. And beautiful for you, follow the Fisk ahead. Runway 27, beautiful job over. You are directly over the road check. That's a thing of beauty there. Monitor tower now 118.5. I've got a Baron over the top of Fisk. White and blue, rock your wings for me. White and blue Baron, I white and blue Baron. 89 Alpha, 89 Alpha. We do have traffic, so let's turn on There's the rock, so okay, that's good. Turn right. Along. Turn right, follow the east-west road, you're following the stairs ahead. So go ahead, start your descent, go ahead, start slowing down, get the gear down. And monitor tower now, 126.6, make sure you join that east-west road, hard right turn to join the east-west so road. We're going to do our best that to a, get a half mile southwest of Fisk, rock your wings for me. Beautiful rock, beautiful rock. Hey, 27 for you, spacing looks great with the Cherokee ahead. Follow the, run, follow the railroad tracks up to the gravel pits, down with inside the gravel pits. Smart tower now one at 18.5. The Baron, make sure you're on so uh, eight, eight nine alpha. Make sure you're on 126.6. Now we'll see you. Kind of orange, white, pantera. The best uh, possible you, thing which that could happen want? is we just make the right turn. Okay, three, six, we're in the right place, and uh, we don't have to great. go around the lake. Uh, the, the orange, white, uh, pantera, rock your wing. If not, we'll just have to, if something happens, it's a little bit of 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 a little 90 knots is That'll very work. slow Follow for runway. Cirrus, the railroad impossible. tracks up to the gravel pit, down the inside the uh, gravel pit, directly over the railroad, the which you're doing an excellent job of. We appreciate that. Page 15 uh, and the monitor tower now, 118.5. Okay. Well so you have to be okay. very mindful when you're flying it slow. I'm going to turn the track hour back on now. We're going to disconnect the autopilot. And we'll leave the yaw damper on for now. We'll just disconnect that as we get uh, closer to landing. And I'm going to start coming back on the power so that we can slow to 135 at 2300 feet, got a thousand to go. As we approach, we want to make sure every single light on the aircraft is on. Hell, I will even turn on the ice light. But when you are flying into Oshkosh, every single light on your airplane should be on. And four flights going to be popping up with alerts here. I'm just going to quickly look down and dismiss those. Power coming back. We'll bring it all the way back now. You can hear that clicking. Not really sure what that is. In real life, I have never really heard the engine backfire or, or pop or anything like that when I brought the power back, like it can sometimes do in Cessnas. 
Got a purple diamond southwest of Fisk coming up 2300 rocket wings for me. All right, there's 2300. Beautiful. Turn right. Or which one do you want? Knots, so let's bring the power okay, three, back three. in. Yep, that'll work. Turn right. Uh, follow the east-west road for runway 36. Right, right will be assigned by the tower. Mark tower 126.6 so and go ahead and start follow that detail. We've got a gaggle coming in. Uh, let's see here, see if I can uh, see if y'all got the altitude separated there. Nope, I got a couple at uh, 2,000, the split y'all up here. All right, I'll turn down red, white, Cessna, rock your wings, mile southwest of Fist, rock your wings for me. There we go, ATC should be a little quieter now. Okay, so I got a mini and a jerk here, y'all fly? Yes, sir. Oh, we're doing oh, flights okay. now? That makes a lot of sense. Uh, turn for the flight, go ahead and turn right, turn right for the flight, you're gonna follow the, uh, the twin diamond ahead. Turn right, follow the flight, and 1,800 feet, and go ahead and start slowing down the red and white Cessna. I thought flights were not permitted. Uh, I guess we're doing flights now. Up the railroad tracks. Follow the railroad tracks. Monitor tire 1, 18.5. You can go ahead and give me that rock so I don't miss you. All right, we're established. Four flights showing we got plenty of space ahead and behind is what I like to see. Monitor tire 1, 18.5. Red and white Cessna. I've got a hawk directly for Papa Bravo. Let's get 18.5 on standby. Beautiful. Well, let's go ahead and turn Let's right. Out first. To tired of getting confused with red and white Cessna. Turn right. Follow the east-west road for runway 36. Turn right. Follow the east-west road. Mark tire now 126.6. Yellow pan here. All right. Sorry. 18 five's on standby yeah, just in case we get runway 127. Beautiful, Ron. Beautiful. And then on comp two, two we've got 26.6 ready to go in case we get uh, runway 26. Everybody coming up the railroad track. Speed back up to 135 for spacing. 1,800 feet, 90 knots, or 2,300 feet, 135 knots. No overwinders, no side by sides. If anybody's in a flight that's coming up the railroad tracks or over in Green Lake, let me know now. my best to maintain speed and altitude, but I'm not fixating on the instruments because my number one priority is looking for traffic, so my speed and altitude are going to vary oh, a bit here. Robin direct fist, rock your wings for me. Uh, as I make sure that I see anybody and any everybody that may be around Good, rock me. my 27 for you. My 27, follow railroad check. That's ripping directly ahead. And down one inside the gravel pit. Mark make sure there's nobody converging five. on the Got right side. The there should be nobody on my left side, but you never know here. I do see actually there's a guy beautiful, on the other side beautiful, of the lake there. Follow the railroad tracks from way 27. We're trying to get some more departures out at the airport. Getting a little backed up there, so we're going to get them so some space. Another quick look at Follow fourth flight now. Runway 27, down Still looking the good. Bar tire now 118.5. Eight. Got a bearing coming up the railroad. Do you have a runway present? Uh, 27, please. Sorry. Okay, Messing with the track error a bit here. Go ahead and start slowing down because you're going to overtake a Cessna ahead. Roger. All right. Getting the track error already there. Keep scanning around for traffic. Keep maintaining yeah, 135, so 2300 uh, feet. For the red -white we're going to leave Green Lake now because our spacing feet. is good. Uh, There's really yet, no one in front of us. And we're going to proceed okay, go on to Ripon. The seven Hotel. Go ahead and There's offset. another guy there on the Just other side of the lake. Just a little bit to the left of the railroad track. And you can keep your speed up. And uh, just maintain uh, 2300. So as you can see here in the, the distance, Ripon, we've got a highway and we've got railroad tracks. Got to make sure you don't the confuse the two. So and, follow uh, the railroad tracks, not the highway. Knots, that's okay. Just the left side of the railroad tracks. Top side of the gravel pits, Mar Tower 118.5. If anything happens, if we get too close Roger, to someone, if uh, the spacing doesn't work out or whatever else, Absolutely. just make a left turn, go back to Ripon, try it again. said no overtaking, no over-unders, no doing anything fancy. If, uh, if you need to do fancy maneuvering, just make a left turn, break out, and then go back to Ripon. Sierra, Blue Sierra is half mile southwest of Fitz, rock your wings for me. Alright, so the other important thing Blue is to make sure we don't Sierra, rock five, two, five, until it's our uh, turn. So if there's a Cirrus in front of us, he may be Blue talking Sierra. to that Cirrus, not us. Rock, so we will be using the perfect. distance to Fisk, which will be up here, to make sure no, that know, um, we're actually a half mile. Okay, go ahead and turn right. Half mile uh, the, they'll make it easier for you. Turn right. Two miles, 1,000 feet tower above. Three six. Tower will assign uh, the left or the right. Monitor tower one two six point six. Make sure you keep that right turn and join the uh, the east west road to follow follow it for the base. 
All right, so we're overhead ripping now. For whatever reason, the churches are huge. Haven't figured that one out. And then again, we got the highway on the right from railroad track on the left. Follow the railroad track. Heading zero nine zero. The railroad track comes out of the grain mill. That's your other VFR point. Is this grain mill here marks the start of the railroad track segment? As always, head on a swivel, looking for traffic. At 2300, like I said. It's not going to be as crazy as uh, 1800. It's another advantage to being at 2300. Beautiful. Uh, Speed up a bit here. Follow railroad tracks for run 27. Down and inside the gravel pit. Monitor tire now 118.5. Welcome, gosh, gosh. All right, crossing over Ripman. Now we got distance to Fisk shown here. And there's also some VFR landmarks along the ground we can use to estimate our distance to Fisk as well. I'll point those out as we get closer. Fisk, you can see it's this tiny little town up here, and then the town of Oshkosh Got a blue stair, oh, here, it's right over the top of Fisk, modern, uh, rocket wings for me. Red, just over the top of Fisk, rocket wings, red series. He said blue, then he said red. Red series, five, six, oh, we'll go off, rocket wings. Beautiful rock now, we can now follow the railroad tracks. And oh, that's another thing. Is, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the software or the controllers are just being picky, but you have to rock it like there's no tomorrow in order for them to see your rock. So we're going to be doing like we're going to be doing a 60 degree bank rock, which is the maximum allowed without parachutes. We're just going to make sure we rock it all the way to uh, part 91 limits. It'll also, be a good test of the yaw damper on this thing because uh, my source doesn't have a yaw damper. Got a couple coming up the railroad because one's way up high, Manzo. So Goal here we go. This is the first landmark where the road splits here. 135 knots it's about three miles from uh, and 99. the two altitudes we're doing for the arrival. Got a Cherokee up high that's moving past blue and white Cherokee rocking wings. What kind of Cherokee would be up there? Beautiful rock. Uh, go ahead and start your descent to 1800 feet. Follow the railroad tracks. Runway 27 down inside the railroad tracks. Mark tire now 118.5. Got another one white, uh, Saratoga, Saratoga, 65 Romeo, rock your wings. You can see there's a guy down there at 1800 There's good rock right here. On the right track, it's not good, that's okay. Turn right, join the east-west road, go ahead and start that right turn. East-west road for the left base, runway 36, tire will find the left or right, modern tire now 126.6. I've got a, uh... So that's three miles. The next landmark is this grain, grain silo and private airport here. Beautiful that's uh, one rock, and a half miles from Fisk. The that's the next railroad landmark. Railroad tracks up to the northeast. Downward inside the gravel pit. And monitor tower one, one eight point five. Welcome to the show. All right, I'm going to start listening because we're getting closer. We should get the call out at about half a mile, so we got a little time. And I got a Cessna coming up, and everybody's looking good today. We're going directly over the railroad tracks. We're not going left or right of the railroad tracks, directly over the railroad tracks to the Fisk Avenue intersection. We'll pick you up by a type and color about a half mile southwest of Fisk. Still some beautiful entry into uh, Green Lake there to find your spacing. We love it. It looks good. Got a uh, red Cessna half mile southwest of Fisk. Two miles, 400 feet below. Uh, maybe a baby rock, a full rock. Eight zero keel, give me a full rock. I've got the Cirrus up high, one, yep, Rocky Wings, half mile southwest of Fisk, Rocky Wings for the Cirrus. I think that's me, so we'll go nice Speed big rock. rock. Turn right, go ahead and start your descent, turn right down to 1800, follow the east-west road for runway 36. Nice turn. MR now 126.6, right. got a red test to half So we're going to Fisk to Avenue Rocky now. This is Highway 44. This is Fisk Avenue. Don't mix up the and two. So we're going to follow test. Fisk now Avenue for that Rocky left base for runway 36, and we're going to go yeah. to COM2. So let's get the flaps down first of all. Yeah, that's And that's switch what we to like COM2. Right 
and we're on 26.6 now. Flaps gave us a little bit of a push. First Four, flap speed is 119. Second flap speed is 108. So we're following Fisk Avenue. We're descending to 1800, and we are slowing to 90 knots. Let's get that second notch of flaps in. The 52 Foxtrot pick up about a 260 heading now. Former fleet 260 heading. There's another the right base for 36 right. It really and pushes you up more back. than my experience in real life. Let's speed up. We want to stay at 90 knots. Uh oh, full power. Okay, the engine kind of almost quit on me there. Had to push the mixture rich really quickly. All right, and uh, now that I got a minute to myself, let's set the altitude bug down to 1800. Cherokee or Piper, rack your wings. You're just inside the interstate. You're going to 36 left today. 36 left. They're going to be assessing on the opposite base for the parallel 36 right. All right, there's 90 knots, 1800 feet. We're looking good. Okay, so a little iffy when the flaps came down. Really kind of porpoised the aircraft. That wasn't great. Uh, not used to that much porpoising in real life with the flaps, so I'll make a note of that. And also, the engine stumbled as I got lower uh, because I was still lean and peak. Wasn't expecting that even easier or either. Usually, I can do lean and peak at this altitude. Uh, so uh, not expecting right that. We went full rich, the saved the engine. In, uh, for three, six right. Three, six right. There's the interstate right. there. He should give me a call when we get closer to the interstate. Make straight in three, six right. Clear land, outer path, the red square. And you can see Oshkosh with all yeah, the airplanes. Got it, sir. Thank you. Everybody's parked yeah. there. Some hot air balloons. It's looking good. Let's make a left turn, get directly over Fisk Avenue. We're a professional pilot, so we're going to do it precisely. A 60 degree rocket at 90 knots, probably not a great idea, so we'll do a 45 degree rocket at this speed. The uh, black and white Mooney, runway 36 left, line up white on the right side of the purple dot. The green Cherokee behind them, line up white left side of the purple dot. Alright, coming over the interstate, should be giving us a call shortly. Guys landing there, doing great. Uh, roll high speed taxi all the way to the end and follow the Notum 2 parking for uh, 5 2 Foxtrot. Good job of uh, landing on the uh, red square. Uh, so do I. Red, uh, steer us over the interstate. Rocky Winch, please. The 5 2 Foxtrot pick up about 1,000. Uh, high speed taxi all the way to the end and just. Uh, if okay, you the damper isn't really sure doing it. Got to bring and, uh, in that rudder. Questions about it uh, overfits, so uh, make sure you have that. Still haven't seen my rock. And uh, have a great day. The uh, red stairs over the interstate, runway 36 right, uh, skinny runway, clear to land, outer pass the red square, outer pass the red square for the red stairs. Right, 36 right, uh, red square, let's do on it. On the right side of the uh, dock, clear for takeoff, runway 36 left. 36 right, right is a right taxiway right normally, they turn it into a runway for Oshkosh. Let's start our descent. The the uh, green Look for that red square, should be about halfway down. The, uh, uh, red dot, or the purple dot for me please. The, uh, Sky lane that's next, uh, two yeah, we're going to have to monitor right our speed because we're a little high and fast. I see the red dot. It's about midway down the uh, airport, so we have yeah, plenty of time to get that speed down, down three, which six, is well. good. All right. Checklist says land uh, approach speed should be uh, 80 knots. I like to do 75 just so I have a little less uh, left power. Left side of the purple dot. You'll be right beside that. Or sorry, yeah, uh, a little firmer landing. Red stairs, you're doing great. Could land uh, out of path the red square. Out or past the red square. So I like to aim for 75 knots because uh, it just makes for a nice firmer landing, a little less float. Yeah, on the right side of the dock, keep it rolling. Uh, if you want to do it by the book, 80 knots on final. These are people taking off. Yeah, the we're we're going to just left, line up weight on the right side of the dock. You'll be right beside that system. Got a uh, red uh, robin over the interstate, Rocky Wings. Alright, red square, power idle, flare it, flare it. Nice and the robin, right. Kind of wheel barrowed it a bit there, square. but. Let's come off the power. Red Actually, no, let's, let's fast taxi. <laughs> per the NOTAM, we've got a fast taxi all the way to the end of the runway when it turns back into a taxiway, so let's keep it going, keep it going. The red and white stuff so is number one now. Line of void on the uh, right side of the purple dot. Three, six, three. Seven ends is on the right. Bonanza, yeah, that's fine. I'm All right, you rolling before that fast there. taxi. Now we can slow down. Do our after landing yeah. items. So let's bring the flaps up. Turn off some of our lights. But we'll leave some of them on. 
And it starts steering with the wheel brakes again. And we can brutally lean the mixture again, down to the X, the T even, if we can get it there. And I'm going to quickly tab out and remind myself the parking situation. Sorry, the taxi situation. All right, taxi routes in Oshkosh. So we make a left onto runway 23 and then another, or sorry, left onto 13 and then a left onto 23 and then a left onto Papa. So two left onto two runways and then left onto a taxiway. And we'll just find somewhere to park. You can see there's a bunch of other people taxiing. So like the cones show, we're going to make a left onto this runway. And then a left onto Power that big runway. Ford base. Big Ford, report two mile right base. Runway system over the interstate, Rocky Wings. Now left onto Papa. Yellow and white Cherokee, runway 36 left, line up weight on the right side of the purple dot. The blue Robin behind the Cherokee. A lot of steering the Cirrus on the ground is momentum. Uh, you can like tap the brakes and let the momentum just carry you around and turn. Only works at certain speeds, but saves a lot of brake wear and tear and prevents oversteering. You all have a great night. Now, one more left. Thanks, you too. Bring that, let that momentum carry the nose over. And now we will just find a place to park. For that red and white Cessna, you can turn into the 36 so right and start your descent for me, please. You're clear to land out of the These rows the are pretty much the, uh, full up. Yellow and white Cherokee, 36 left, you're clear for takeoff. There's an empty spot, we'll just park there. So let's try to negotiate these signs as best we can. I'm 100% sure this isn't what you're supposed to do in real life, but. Interest of uh, just getting off the taxiway so that people can go take off. I'm just going to turn off here. Three, six left. Clear to land on the purple dot. Yeah, this is definitely not what you're. Oh man, and yeah, there's no nose wheel steering, so this is exceptionally hard in the grass. So blue Robin, you're clear for takeoff. Exceptionally hard in the grass. Okay, Actually, bring it over. The bring the it Robin, over. On the runway, on the runway, you're clear for takeoff. The other one holds short of the uh, runway three six left. This is the home built section, as you can see. So we're uh, definitely not a home built. But neither is that 152, so I don't feel too bad. Alright, shut down pretty straightforward. Just avionics off, get the nav lights off. Power all the way back, mixture all the way idle. Now the airplane is, the engine's still going to run with the mixture idle, uh, which is disconcerting at first. Um, what you got to do is turn it off. And which brings me to my next point. Um, there's no fuel timer set, so I ran this entire thing on the left tank. So that was my bad. Um, I'm used to my airplane, which has a 15 minute fuel timer. So when you fly this airplane, um, normally in the G1000, there's like a menu option. Uh, there's, I'm 100% sure that we don't have that here. Yeah, we don't, we just, All right, here we so go. normally you can set up a menu reminder Robin. to, uh, Line up on the right side of the purple dot, the brown Cessna behind the Robin. Normally you can set up, up a menu reminder to dot. remind you to switch your fuel tanks, but this time, uh, apparently it's not here, so you will have to remember to switch your tanks. Anyway, continuing the shutdown, the engine has been shut down, so you can turn off the alternators and turn off the strobe lights, turn off the mags, turn off the batteries. Then you want to open up the center console and put the um, safety pin back. You can put the cover back on for the caps handle. You can close the center console if you want. Oh, and I forgot to mention, you can click here to virtually turn on your headset, reduces engine noise. You can also take a look at your Hobbs and TAC, which do count up. So you can see I've got 7.1 Hobbs hours and 4.2 TAC hours. And we are basically done. So let me go to the external view. Um, and that pretty much wraps it up. So this was a fly-in to the Pilot Edge SimVenture Oshkosh event um, in the new Torque Sim SR22, the turbo normalized version, generation three. 
Uh, you can see it's a very busy event. We got lots of aircraft flying in. I mean, all of these aircraft that are parked here, these are fake, of course. But these guys that are taxiing, these are actually people on Pilot Edge who are arriving or departing SimVenture. Um, I hope you guys learned something about the SR-22. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to be putting this one up on YouTube in case anybody wants to come back to it and remind themselves how to fly this airplane. Uh, all in all, it's great. Uh, there's only a few bugs. Like I mentioned, the roll trim needs to be, uh, first of all, it needs to be faster. And secondly, you need to be able to see the effects of putting roll trim in the ailerons, which is what you use to accomplish uh, setting your aileron trim before takeoff. So that needs to be fixed. Uh, and of course, it would be great if the perspective avionics um, were expanded. That way, it wouldn't have to remember to switch tanks every 15 minutes. The aircraft could remind me. But in the future, I will be setting my own timer so that I don't forget. Other than that, though, I think this is a great airplane. Definitely worth the money. And uh, have a great night, guys. I'll see you all later.